afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Cooking Made Easy with Steve Cushing. Uh, this is probably one of many that we're going to do. We've had an episode before. And um, feel free to utilize the chat. Feel free to ask questions as we go. If you don't want to use the chat and you want to say them out loud, by all means, do that. But I would like to, with no further ado, introduce our chef for this afternoon. Please give a warm welcome for Mr. Steve Cushing. Greetings, everybody. Greetings, greetings. How's everybody doing today? I hope everybody's doing well. Um, welcome to my kitchen. This is my little uh, paradise, so to speak. I spend a lot of time in my kitchen. Um, before I start on the recipe, I did want to share with everybody a little kitchen gadget. Actually, it's not that little. Uh, it's actually kind of big um, that I bought. And I bought it uh, two months ago now. Not even two months ago. Um, and I love it. I actually have uh, another gadget that um, I actually don't use as much anymore because I got this one. And basically what it is is an air fryer. And it's the Ninja Max. I do love this thing. It's not the biggest one they make, and it's not the smallest one they make. Um, but for me, it's just perfect. It actually does tons and tons of things. Um, here's the basket. And that bottom piece comes out for cleaning. And all your drippings go down underneath that. Um, I've made fried chicken in it. I've made basic ballpark hot dogs. If you want a hot dog that actually tastes like you're in a ballpark, make it in an air fryer. Um, I rave about them. They are delicious. Um, you can make corn dogs in it. Um, now, of course, you can make French fries in it. That's kind of the one thing they rave about. I make my own homemade French fries. I cut the potatoes up and put them in there. Um, you just got to make sure you don't crowd the basket. You don't want multiple layers on top of each other because they won't cook evenly. So, um, but I do love that machine and I highly recommend it for anybody uh, for their kitchen, especially people who don't like using their oven. This is something that will replace your oven in many ways, as well as uh, your stove top when you don't want to make a splashing mess for like fried chicken and stuff. Uh, you can even do hamburgers in there. Haven't done one yet, but you can. I've done a steak. Um, so, so Steve, let me ask you really quick. Like, um, so one thing that we found in our family, like the air fryer is a, an absolute must, like gotta have it. Right. Yeah. Something that we actually found that we love to do, even if we are starting to cook something in the oven, we'll take it out of the oven a few minutes before it's done and kind of finish it off in the air fryer. And believe it or not, one of the things that my family absolutely loves is, you know, those little like dollar pizzas that you can get that you would normally like toss in the oven. We yep. put those, you put it in the air fryer, like put it in the microwave for like a minute and then you put it in the air fryer and it just crisps everything up. I love finishing food in the air fryer more so than just like cooking it the whole time in there. I think but finishing it and reheating things is awesome too. Yes, it is great for reheating food as well as crisping stuff up that you cook the first stage in, say, an oven. Um, so it's a actually made, it's an oilless fryer. Is that what it is? Yes, there is no oil whatsoever other than what you put on the product. Like, for example, I made baked potatoes the other day. And basically, I rubbed the outside of the baked potato with olive oil. And then I put some uh, sea salt on it and poked it a couple times and put it in the air fryer still takes roughly about 40 minutes in an air fryer at 400 degrees uh which is not an hour long or over an hour long if you have a really massively large baked potato but you're not making a whole lot of mess um you're not having to heat up the entire apartment or house by turning the oven on um so yeah i like it for those factors that it doesn't heat the entire place up because I love baked potatoes and now I can make them during the summer and not have to worry about heating up the apartment. Does it keep everything moist as well? Yes. Um, it will seal in moisture. In, I think the one flaw I found 
was if you were going to make fried chicken, don't use boneless, skinless chicken, especially thighs, because they're they end up being too thin. And if you don't watch them, they will tend to overcook and dry out. But if you're going to make fried chicken, I recommend bone in, skin on. Um, that way you get the drippings of the skin and you can pull the skin off when you're done before you eat it. Um, but that keeps it all moist. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask for our audience while you are transitioning into our dish for today, I'm going to ask um, if you have an air fryer or if you use an air fryer frequently, or maybe you want one, what would you cook in it? Or what do you love to cook in it? What's your favorite thing to toss in there? Get chime in in the chat with us and we will kind of share those throughout the session. But um, so I'm not in your house, so I can't smell this food, but what are we, uh, what are we cooking today, Steve? All right, what we're going to be making is um, sauteed cabbage or fried cabbage, um, depending on how you want to verb it. Um, it uh, basically, the full menu is pork chop, and I'm doing a steamed vegetable. And uh, to save time and for the magic of TV, I've already made my pork chop. I put it under the broiler with some barbecue sauce on it. That's the way I kind of like my pork chops. And I use boneless uh, pork chops, uh, center cut. Basically, I usually buy an entire pork tenderloin um, and cut it into pork chops. Um, What's the sauce that you use, Steve, the barbecue sauce? Um, the one I used today was baby back. Uh, I mean, um, um, Sweet baby rays. Yeah, baby rays. Yeah. yeah, I had to remember. <laughs> um, I thought I had a different barbecue sauce in my refrigerator and I realized I used it all on my chicken. Uh, that I made uh, last week. So I had to pull this from my pantry. So, uh, but I like all kinds of barbecue sauce. Um, what I have here down on this camera is a couple cabbages. Um, basically, when you pick up a cabbage um, from the store, it's going to have some leafing on it that you're going to want to peel off. And you can do this in the store or you can do it when you get home. But that's Basically, until you get down to the nice, clean portions of the cabbage. And that's basically what that looks like. And it's nice and glassy looking, and that's where you're looking for. And I can take that off uh, after I cut it up. So I'm going to save this one for a different recipe down the road, uh, probably next weekend or something. Um, I already have part of this cut up and I'm going to show you how I cut it up. Once you've got it like this, you're going to cut it down here. You're going to start at the core and cut down until you get it cut in half. Once you get the two halves cut, you know, once you have it in two halves, you're going to take out the core. So once you get rid of the core, and I like to keep a waste pail off to the side where I put all my trimmings for everything. And then I take that to the trash can. That way I'm not filling my sink up with some nasty mess. It's all neatly organized, so to speak. So I'm just gonna take this and shred it up. Without cutting my fingers, of course. Hey, you're scaring me, Steve. Watch those digits, man. Don't want to get the digits, you know, you don't want to lose no fingers. No, don't want to do that. But you're looking for a fairly small shaving, so to speak. Um, less than a quarter of an inch. So now, Steve, the problem I have when I cook cabbage is that I usually will chop it up and then I get a skillet out and it, I find out that my skillet is way smaller than I thought it should be. And, you know, it's kind of like cooking collards too, right? Like you have this, you have this huge amount of collard greens, you have this huge amount of like leafy kind of item. And then as it starts to cook, it'll shrink down and soften down. And then you're like, well, where'd the rest of it go? So what size pan do you recommend? Like if we're doing maybe like a half a head of cabbage. I use this one. This is, um, I think it's 14 inches if I'm not mistaken. Okay. But it's deep though. It's deep. You okay. want something that's got a good side on it. Um, you can even use a deep pot if you feel more comfortable doing it in a pot. 
so it doesn't fall all over the stove. If you're kind of messy, sometimes I'm messy, sometimes some of it falls off on the stove and it'll probably happen today. Hey, it happens. Um, so it's actually a very easy dish. Um, once you've got it cut up like this, you're gonna wanna make sure pieces are broken up. And that looks like it's all fine and dandy. So I'm gonna get it in the bowl here and I think I'm gonna turn my uh, pan on. It's gotta switch to the right camera. My cameras don't like me. There we go. I have a question for you. One of the things that I always get frustrated with, and maybe it's because I have a galley kitchen, uh, but when prepping and cooking things, especially from scratch, you tend to accumulate stuff and, and it gets cluttered. Do you have any tips on how to keep a clean, organized kitchen? Um, like I said, the pail is one of the big things. Um, having a pail to put uh, any trimmings in, like when I peeled the carrots earlier, all those trimmings are down in the bottom of this pail. Um, I opened up a new thing of butter. I just threw that in there for right now. Um, and I'll separate it later. I'll take that and put it in my recycling. And then I'll turn around and take the rest and just dump it in my trash. Um, I try to stage the kitchen accordingly um, so that I can see what I'm doing. Let's see. I don't know if this camera will. Yeah, we got it. We can see your, your pan. I kind of have things staged out, the pan. I have my oils, my uh, vinegar, and my utensils, and salt and pepper. I try to have things staged so that I don't have to go hunting for anything while I'm in the middle of cooking. Huh. You know, I don't, I want to, when I'm doing a, a Pacific recipe, I want to make sure I'm, I'm aware of what I'm doing and um, that I don't need to hunt for anything. That's just, that's just kind of me. I just, I, I'm very organized in that respect. Um, I already have the butter in here. And basically this recipe calls for a tablespoon of unsalted butter. I actually use a little bit more because I'm actually using a little bit bigger head of cabbage. Um, the cabbage calls for a medium to small head of cabbage. I actually use more of a medium to a large head of cabbage. Um, and then it also calls for extra virgin olive oil. I don't know if you can see that. Mm -hmm. And it calls for, oh, what do I remember? I have to remember exactly what it calls for. It calls for one tablespoon. And again, I'll probably double it up and do two. So Steve, you're being really professional with a tablespoon measure there. Um, I usually don't, but for this, I'm doing it just so you guys can see, you know, to measure it out. Right. But I just kind of wing it sometimes. It's just. I think we can get heavy, like heavy handed though. And that kind of takes away from the, the healthy part of it. Right. Like if I'm just like pouring, I usually use the cap. Like I use the cap as my measure, like while I'm doing it. And I think that's pretty close to a tablespoon actually. Depending yeah. If it's like that. Yeah, the, the, the cap actually will work quite well. Um, and I've already had this heating up for a little bit, so the butter's mostly melted already. And I just added the olive oil, and now I'm adding the cabbage. We use this we just at a medium to medium high heat. Um, Case in point, whole bunch of cabbage. And I'll see where, we'll see where it ends up after you finish. <laughs> much lower yes it does shrink down an awful lot <laughs> dr bauer says you are so concise <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that will shrink down um you need to toss it and that, i'm getting ready to do that in a second here um and actually hey steve could you technically fry your cabbage in the air fryer I'm sure there's an air fryer recipe for that. Um, I haven't done it yet. But I keep looking. The book, I don't think I've cooked a single thing that was in the uh, book that came with the air fryer. Everything I've cooked has been from recipes I found online. 
I, think, I hear Pinterest is the place to go for, for recipes. Oh, I just Google. I just like, and it's gotten to the point where my uh, iPad knows exactly what I'm asking. I just, I put in the main ingredient and immediately it follows with air fryer. And I'm like, okay, you're getting too smart. <laughs> yeah. Predictive yeah. analytics is what that's called. So yeah. um, this recipe, Steve, you're only calling for salt and pepper for seasoning. And I know for me personally, I happen to use um, Lowry's makes like a seasoned pepper and it's a combination of like three or four different peppers. And I love to cook with it. I don't like to season my food after like if I'm going to like right before I eat it, I just want it like plain black pepper for that. But when I'm cooking that Lowry's like seasoned pepper is my jam. So I wanted to ask the people that are in the audience to kind of pop in the chat for me a little bit. What's your like go-to seasoning that you got to have, whether it's salt, pepper, whatever that you like, what's the one you go to? Cause I'm really curious. What do you got, Steve? Nature seasoning. And what is this? What's More it? This is Morton's Nature Seasoning, and this has got uh, pepper, salt, it's actually sea salt, garlic, onion powder, paprika, um, and probably 15 other different ingredients in it. Um, I do like using this for certain things, um, but for this, um, yeah, I stick with just salt and pepper, and I kind of season it as I'm cooking. Because uh, salt will tend to pull the wa uh, water out of the item, specifically like cabbage, mushrooms, certain things like that. Um, when you put the uh, salt on it, it actually pulls any water content uh, out. And this, you don't have to move it too much um, because you want it to get brown. So that's why I haven't touched it a whole lot. And it is already starting to shrink. And it smells pretty darn good. So some feedback from the chat. We've got like um, a couple people are saying onion powder. A couple others are saying garlic powder. I'm with that jam too. I would use garlic in just about everything as well. Yeah. Um, the Lowry's um, seasonings, really good. Um, one of our students is sharing that there's a low sodium variety, which is really good, especially when you're talking about like the healthy eating piece, right? Like we don't realize, I don't think how much sodium we consume on a regular basis. And when you start adding the seasonings, big time, big, big time, another garlic powder. And then um, good old Rob here is sharing that garlic is good for digestion as is cumin. And he says also hot sauce. Robert puts hot sauce on everything. We all know this. I do. It's not, a, it's definitely the, the truth. I don't think that there's anything I don't put hot sauce on. But like uh, what brand of hot sauce? Is it like Texas Pete brand, like that type of variety? Or are you talking more Tabasco? So it depends on what the dish is. I think if it's something that's very traditional, like uh, eggs or like, uh, you know, potatoes or something like that, I'll go for either a, a Louisiana type of hot sauce. So like Tabasco, red, stuff like that. But if it's something that's a little like a like a really nice deli sandwich or you know something along that, um, I'll go for a higher end, um, more ingredient based hot sauce. Uh, I will make an exception, however, sometimes, and I think with this is I'm thinking maybe maybe substitute hot sauce for soy sauce. Oh, there you maybe. go. Kind of give it like an Asian flavor. Mm hmm. Well, the soy sauce you would really have to like be careful with the sodium on that too, right? Yeah, you could always go low sodium, but I would just be uh, very gentle with how much you use. I think, um, and Steve, you can give me your opinion on this too, but I think as Americans, I mean, I know we're the most overweight because of the type of food we eat, but even when cooking, I think we tend to over season and over um, saturate things with sauces. Mm -hmm. So little is always is better. If you overdo it, you don't taste any of it. Yeah, um, Melissa put in the chat cayenne pepper and I we use a lot of cayenne as well. Like that's a great way to give a dish a nice little kick without adding a bunch of extra. Yes, and you know, we talked about worrying about sodium but if you're worried about calories as well, seasonings is the way to go. We, uh, we don't realize it, but there are quite a bit of calories in your sauces. If you're ever at like Buffalo Wild Wings, if you look at it, they'll tell you the calorie content for each individual sauce. 
And um, I mean, they're pretty high. They're pretty high. So um, cayenne pepper is an awesome one to do as a substitute for hot sauces and stuff like that. Definitely. Yes. Great point. So Steve, you cooked out pork chops earlier today. What'd you put on them when you cooked them? Just uh, a barbecue sauce. Just and the I, barbecue sauce? Yep. And I just put it under the broiler. I just wanted to do something quick and simple. Um, See, but I haven't tried it yet because I think these pork chops that I've had pre-cut months ago and sealed them um, are a little too thin. But next time I, I buy a loin and cut some pork chops, I'm going to cut them much thicker so I can do them in the air fryer. Oh, yeah. Okay. I like Did to I pan question? fry. I like to pan fry pork chops. Is the broiler a fair alternative to that or like a healthier alternative? Um, I think they're both about the same. It's just a you know, whichever you prefer. And when I put barbecue sauce on it, I like to put it in the broiler. When you're buying, um, I'm not a big pork fan. When you're buying pork chops, what are you looking for here? I'm looking for center cut uh, pork chops, basically. Okay. No bone, boneless, um, not as much fat. Um, it may have, um, especially like when you're buying the whole loin, if you have a big family and you're gonna buy the whole loin, it's going to have some fat on it and you can of course cut that off um but it's usually on one side of the loin and so when you buy regular pork chops center cut pork chops you'll see that fat along one edge and that's just um it's to be expected you just don't want it to be very thick they should have trimmed a good portion of it off already thank you sir all right see this is coming along let me switch back to this camera I had I turned the heat up a little bit on it. Ah, wrong foot, wrong camera. <laughs> I need to label these cameras. I keep thinking of Wayne's World. Camera one, camera, camera two, camera one, camera two. <laughs> so you have much more wiggle room with your cabbage in that pan now. So uh, clearly we have, we're starting to soften up, yeah? Yep, it, it hasn't browned as much as I expected it to do by now. Um, I'm trying not to move it around too much, but. Is that something that you're looking for? Do you want it to have crispy brown edges? Yeah, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for some browning to happen. So that's kind of what I'm waiting for now. I'm just kind of letting it do its thing. Um, I can show you, I have two steamers and this is my baby steamer and that's how I'm, I'm doing my carrots I don't know if you can, can you see that yeah. mm -hmm. so um, I have a bigger one when I do broccoli uh, or cauliflower or anything uh, of a bigger quantity I have a bigger steamer that I, I use I do like my steamer I don't boil pretty much anything in, when it comes to vegetables. I uh, very rarely buy canned vegetables. Um, if I do, I'm using them when I'm making like soups and stuff because they're easy and convenient to throw into a soup. Um, but canned vegetables tend to be processed too much and you lose all the nutrients. Whereas if you steam them, all those nutrients are still locked in. So that's my big pet peeve about vegetables. You know. Same with frozen. Frozen has less preservatives. Yes. And frozen with a bag, you can nuke it, you know, or you can take it and throw it in a steamer. You know, yep. And these take three, three and a half minutes in, the, in a microwave, or I can just pull them out of that bag and put them in a steamer and steam them. And they take maybe seven to eight minutes, something like that. Steve, while your um, cabbage is finish polishing itself there, um, I wanted to ask like, so if I was cooking this, I have a German background and I grew up on cabbage and potatoes and onions. And so if I was cooking this dish, I would probably add onion to it. Um, I wanted to actually chime in for the chat. If you were cooking this or if you were gonna make this, is there anything else that you would add to it, whether it be um, another vegetable or some type of meat or seasonings, what would you add um, just based off of your taste and your style of cooking? 
And um, what, Steve, would you add to this? So giving an option for anybody to chime in in the chat and then also asking you, you know. I would definitely add onions. That's kind of my big thing. I like to add onions to it and garlic. And um, if I was going to do a different, completely different dish with it, I'd probably slice potatoes and start cooking them first. Um, I'd thinly slice them, probably kind of like I slice these carrots. You know, I'd get them fairly thin and cook them a little bit, get them partially cooked with a little bit of olive oil and then add the cabbage and, and add the potatoes back and let them sit on top of the cabbage. Okay. And you can use, you can ask, also add uh, brats, uh, kielbasa. Um, you know, I like all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, a student is sharing that onions and or sausage with cabbage too. And you know, Rob made mention about kind of some soy sauce and adding in that Asian flavor. And I think maybe that's something, um, I know personally, I overlook that when I think about this because I usually think about this as more of like a hearty dish but my gosh it would be so good with some asian seasoning in there as well i don't know if you can actually tell but it is starting to brown yeah it's actually it's almost there give it another minute or two so um, how do you know that it's done though like if i'm cooking this on my stove how do i know when it's time for me to to be like okay it's done at this point, you could actually pull it off. I mean, it's all fairly wilted. It's done. I'm just trying to get it to brown. So do we want it, like, should it be crispy, like, or should it be fairly soft? If some pieces are going to be crispy, some are not. Um, the, the closer to the core, those pieces are, are a little heartier, and they will end up being a little thicker and therefore uh, crisper. I... I mean, if I, hook, if I cooked it at a little bit of a higher heat, it may have browned faster and would have stayed crispier, crisper. But, yeah, you know, I think that's all a matter of preference. Right. Um, what you want, what you like. So kind of like pasta, right? Some people like their pasta really al dente, and some people yes. like it much softer. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So yeah. what you're telling me is that I can't mess this up. There's really no wrong way. Like, it's, it's about how I want it. There's definitely no wrong way to do it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and pull some of this off. Turn my heat down. That looks so good. We were talking earlier, for those of you that um, are in the uh, audience with us, we were talking earlier how cabbage is one of those things that tastes really good, but when you cook it, like your, your house is not going to smell good when you cook it, but it, it doesn't taste like it smells. And um, we were chatting about the fact that it's like the opposite of coffee. Coffee, you can smell coffee and you're like, oh, it smells so good. But then to taste it, you're like, what? It's really bitter, bitter and not appetizing, but I think cabbage is just so delicious. Oh, I didn't do it. I forgot. What did you forgot? I, f I forgot to add my apple cider vinegar. Oh, shoot. So I'm going to add some just to this serving that I have on this plate. And then I'll add some to the actual frying pan. Because I actually tell you, the recipe calls for you to take it off the heat before you add this. So. And you, what, is this, what is this for? Does this take like bitterness out of it or? It adds a little what's the best way to describe it um I'm trying to see how can i phrase this it basically adds a little bit of a zippy acidic flavor okay um and those who like apple cider vinegar can put more um I actually, when I first made it the first time, I wasn't sure how much I was going to like it. And I didn't put a lot in. And 
Then I turned around when I went to have seconds, I added more. <laughs> yeah, and I think the like anything that's on the apple cider, like apple cider vinegar in particular, like if I'm gonna marinate pork, I usually put some type of like apple juice or orange juice or something like that in there because the acidity just pairs really well with it in my opinion. Right, and that's kind of the, the idea is it's gonna add that little bit of acidic flavor to the cabbage. And there are several different things you can make with this. I chose a pork chop and carrots, um, but you can do it with chicken. Um, I think depending on the fish, you could even do it with fish. Um, and then of course you can do it the other way. You can go ahead and do it with kibasa or uh, beer brats or something along those lines. Yeah, all very good. So I see you have your final dish here. Can you tell me, out of curiosity, how big is that plate? This plate is... Um, a regular dinner size plate, or is it the smaller size down? That's a ba basic dinner size, 12 inches, I would say. Okay. Yeah. This is what I would eat. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, would, I would eat more of the cabbage and probably only one pork chop, and then I'd... I'd probably put more carrots on here than I did because um, I do love carrots. Um, I like carrots so many different ways. Um, yeah. I can roast carrots. I can you know, I can steam carrots. I can eat them raw. I just love them. <laughs> so I want to give a chance for anybody that might have any questions or um, any comments or anything that we want to we might want to address in the chat. I want to give you a chance to kind of pop those in if you have anything you want to share. Uh, our cooking made easy with our resident non-chef, officially non-chef, but still a chef, uh, Steve here is going to occur every month. And we will happily take suggestions on any recipes or anything you might want to see. Yeah. Uh, us cook, yeah. right? If, if you have any suggestions, I actually have something I'm thinking about doing next month but I will take suggestions if somebody has something else they'd rather have me make. But I'm, I'm thinking about doing a corn casserole, uh, which is actually a really nice side dish. Um, and I don't know if corn casserole is probably the right terminology for it, in my opinion. It's made out of cream corn, corn, and corn muffin mix, among other things. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's baked in the oven for about an hour. So I will actually do two of them. I will do one prior so it's made and then I will show you how it's mixed up and put in a container to cook in the oven and how long it takes to cook and the temperature and all that. Because it's really an easy dish to make and then it can be served with pretty much anything. Right. I think for that one though, if you have a preferences that your corn is savory and not sweet, and that's kind of like, that's the Southern cornbread argument, right? Like, yeah, you can actually add certain things to it. You can add honey to it. You can add a little bit of sugar to it. Um, it's all a matter of preference and how sweet you want it or don't want it. Okay. Well, any closing comments? Camp cornbread. Yes. I think I've heard that as well. Yeah. Yeah. If anybody has any closing comments, you can go ahead and share them now. Otherwise, uh, Steve, I'll give you a last little second here to wrap up and then we will finish out this video will be um we'll be adding some uh, what is it called subtitles we'll be adding <laughs> subtitles to the video and we will be posting it on our virtual student center youtube uh so we do thank you for engaging in that and for joining us today steve final thoughts yeah we'll have the full recipe included with any uh specific details um that you might need uh, as far as cooking, heat temperature and such. Um, but I hope you enjoyed. Um, I hope you decide to make this um, for your family and for yourself. Um, other than that, everybody have a great week. Yes, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we usually try to close out every session with uh, Zoom hands. I don't know why we always wave by all crazy. <laughs> On, uh, on zoom so we hope you guys have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of your week give us a shout if you have any ideas for upcoming 
uh, Cooking with Non Chef Steve sessions, and we look forward to seeing you too soon. Bye. Bye bye, everybody.